It's nice. Yeah. Not real warm. It's nice. Do I really need notes for this? No. No, this is just a conversation. You're going to talk from what you know. You don't need notes. You don't need we'll you know about, Don't you worry. Do you uh, still remember good. about your life? <laughs> <laughs> do you remember your life? What's today? <laughs> if you don't, you might need those. Otherwise, we'd like to hear. We like to hear about you. So, thanks a lot, George, for taking the gauntlet and coming here to give a little talk at lunchtime. And uh, we appreciate you taking the time to do that. I appreciate you asking. Yeah, we all met George last year, and I, he probably doesn't remember me because I can't remember ever talking to him directly, but. Emailing him. I'm sure he remembers you. <laughs> I never met him. Right? Would you like me to kick Tom right now? Yeah, I know. Tom sometimes picks on me. Don't feel alone. <laughs> don't, don't feel alone. I, I had a tendency to, uh, I start talking about history. And, well, George, it, it really went like this. Okay. <laughs> and, and Tom, last year, I wanted to clean the stone for the person he was talking, talking. about. I said, let me clean the stone. He goes, no, then it'll look new and it'll, it, it'll just ruin everything. It won't be old. <laughs> so, he it, has an opinion. Okay. Um, so I, Richard Walters is over here. and he, Usually it's Peter Elder behind there, but Richard's doing it today. Okay. And what they do, they... I learned last week they can put it into YouTube's on YouTube too. Oh, if you through the museum so site, yeah. Yeah, and also we have um, a digital book, right? Is that what it's called? Of the Esther, it's an addition to the Esther Dunn book. They're updating the history in Webster, and what they've done is put that online too. So this will become part of it, probably. Okay. You know. So I just want you to know that. I, I, I live my life wide open. Everybody. <laughs> we, we love to record history. And uh, this, this month is Preservation Month. And uh, so many things we do for the Webster Museum is we have a Historic Properties Committee, and they uh, have also identified this year uh, six homes. I was going to say five or six homes. Six homes for a historic plaque, and they'll be getting uh -huh. that tomorrow night. It's uh, and then this is these Including are some of the homes house. behind you. What do you say? <laughs> Including your own house. Oh yeah, Andy has <laughs> right behind you. Yeah, our house is right there. <laughs> That's the right house. That's not. So you, down on two fifty. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Which I stole. Right. Yeah. Because it was on okay. sale and nobody would touch it. Okay. And <laughs> so says, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to tell the story but next time? Okay. Wow. So we'll continue on with George's story. George, will, sure. you can start, George. Uh, yeah. Don't forget, we all got a barn sale coming up. So anything you got to donate, please bring. Thank you. It's got to be old. Does it have to be old? No. No, you got no. tchotchke stuff that you don't want really to... Bring it. We'll sell it. We have two barns. Yeah, we have. And now. Yeah, one is brick, one is water. And you put it in the back <laughs> in our barn. Well, in case that okay. I'm here, that nowhere to go. Okay. Hi, everybody knows. You usually talk. I'm George Baker. I was born in 1951, down in Binghamton. And I was brought up on my grandfather's farm with my parents until 1967. And I learned a lot about life growing up on a farm. Mm. I mean, nowadays you get up and go to school, then you get up and go to work in the barn, and you get done with your chores, then you go to school, and then you come back. And I learned how to drive there, I had cars to drive around in the fields, and enjoyed that. And my uh, grandfather passed in 67, and my family decided to move to Rochester, because my grandmother had felt the farm had uh, done too much damage to the family by all the work they had to do. So they sold the farm, we moved to Rochester. How big was the farm? 380 acres. Wow. We, had, we had 50 head of cattle. Wow. And people will look at me and wonder why I don't like pets. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had this little black Angus calf that I uh -oh. raised. It followed me around. Uh -oh. it, it, we did everything. 
I come home from school one day and he's hanging by his heels from a tree. Oh. Yeah. So I haven't got real close to animals after that. But uh, that that was a great time. I had many friends, and even though we moved up here, I stayed very close to my grandmother. And uh, we talked often, and she passed away in 2007. Oh, wow. And the relationship we had <coughs> was close enough that they called me to come down. I was debating when to go down. I was the last one that got to talk to her while she was alive. Yeah. And everybody said, she won't go until you tell her it's okay to go. And I, I did. Then we went to lunch. And they called us to come back, and she had gone before we got back. Yeah. How old was she? Ninety-seven. Yeah. Nice. Wow. Ninety-seven. She was. I, I would call, and she was going through through uh, dementia because she, she lived in her house until she was like ninety-three, ninety-four, and then she'd leave the toaster in the toaster for whatever. And, but I'd always call her, and she'd always respond to me. And they, they told me I would be the last one that to talk to her because I tell her it was okay to go. Yeah, isn't that something? And, and I'm I'm going back to Rockville <coughs> in two weeks for the 50th high school reunion. <laughs> they 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 let you go even though you didn't graduate there. And I, I'm going back to see people I haven't seen in. Well, a lot of them came to my grandmother's funeral because they knew I would be there. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I went back down, and I still have relatives not far from there, and I visit there. But the, the most of my life has been up here where... Uh, George, where, I'm sorry, where did you, um, where did your grandmother live? Harpersville. Harpersville. It's about a half hour southeast of Binghamton. Oh. So <coughs> almost on the Pennsylvania border, then? About 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, we, we were really close, and it was, a lot of my uh, father's family was around there. My uh, one aunt just passed away. I got another aunt and uncle in the 80s I'm going to be going uh -huh. to see when I go back down. You see my cousins, and there, there's still a lot of history in Binghamton, or Harpersville, for me. It, it I just went back through there a year or so ago, and my grandmother's house is abandoned now. And I just see the oh, grass up God. this high on it, and it... it I know, I it, bet. It, it just hurts. Did they, yeah. put, did they put it up for sale and no one bought it? Or what? Um, they, well, the, the barn got torn down shortly after the farm was sold, and my grandmother was put in a home to live with somebody that takes care of them. And um, the, the house was sold a couple times, and the last people that lived there just said they trashed the house and they just walked away. No, no, nobody wanted it. When, how old was the house itself, do you know? Oh, I have no idea. I think they moved in there in the 30s or 40s. And I'm, I'm talking stone foundation, dirt floor. Yeah, sure. It's, so it's probably pre-1900. Oh, I, I'm sure. Oh, and, yeah. and there was, it was one bathroom, two bedrooms, and the one bedroom, if you've got a twin-size bed in a, in a closet, <laughs> you had a hard time turning around in there. But that's where us kids stayed when we went there. Well, at least the bathroom was inside, though, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the bathroom was inside, but th there was uh, such a good time there. I, I had a lot of good friends, yeah. and I learned the value of working. You know, if you're going to do something, do it, do it right the first time, because if you don't, you haven't got time to do it the second time. Or something like that. And it, it was, <laughs> yeah. It was. It was just, just great. But I got to learn to drive tractors and cars and trucks, and it was fun. Then we moved to Rochester. Lived in Henrietta for. My parents lived there until '73 when they moved to Florida. But I met my wife on a blind date, and she used to live on Tanglewood Court in Webster. You know where Tanglewood Court is. Yeah. Off of Lake Road by the underpass. Yeah. Oh, Fairview, yes. Fairview oh, Circle? Yes. It's off of Fairview Circle. Mm -hmm. Nice. It backs up to the railroad, the old railroad right away. And we, can, we take a walk down that trail, we still see the house. Yeah. But uh, we met on a blind date, <coughs> and uh, we dated for like exactly five years and two days from the time we met to the time <laughs> we got married. 
some day, there's dates that I, <coughs> I'll never forget. And the thing about it was, I had just bought my new car the year, before, the year I graduated. <laughs> and it, I used to go across the Bay Bridge before it opened over 100 miles an hour <laughs> in that car. And when I met her, I had pulled the muscles in my leg and I couldn't drive my car. So my friend drives the car with his girlfriend, and I'm sitting in the back seat of my car, meeting my <laughs> to be wife. Whose car is this? Mine. Well, why aren't you driving it? <laughs> because I can't. And uh, little did I know at the time that that would be we'd be together the rest of our lives. So, what was the first car? A 1969 Pontiac GTO. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Oh, 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 oh. It, that tells everything. <laughs> um, simple, it's, let's put it like this. At 20,000 miles, I had gone through four sets of rear tires. Oh, wow. <laughs> Where I, did you do this? <laughs> uh, Coming almost, across the Bay Bridge. <laughs> almost any place. I, I, I would, I pegged a speedometer on the Bay Bridge before. <laughs> It was even open, and uh, do I realize some of this? That was kind of stupid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was. Yeah, well. I got through it. It was part That's of growing up, and I got. I proposed to my wife in her uncle's house. I think it's 460 Lake Road. Oh, okay. It was, um, the last, if you're coming <coughs> eastbound, it was the last house on the lake, at, at the curve, because people kept. Crash into the trees, oh, and uh, a couple times we were there. We'd have to go out because people were crushed in their cars. Oh, oh my goodness! Wow. Yeah, but jeez, uh, it, it's my life in Webster has really. That, that's what it's all about. Since I met my wife, her fa her family's been here. Her father grew up in Arundacoit, and he was a builder in Webster. Who was that? Norm Curry. Okay. You, you might see his name on one building in town. Well, he built the Arboretum, That's right? it. Okay. He and I did that together. Yeah, he, he was in... And he Charlie was, Sexton, the three yeah. of us put that building together. What a combination. Yeah. Yeah. The original one. Yeah. yeah. And Charlie's still here, isn't he? I, I think Charlie's He's still around. Yeah. It was interesting. Norm, Charlie, Charlie started the whole thing, and then he asked me to do the designs and stuff so he could take things around to people. And then he says, I'm talking to Norm. And he says, I'm going to try and get him to uh, get the thing built. And uh, he said, we got to reduce the size of the building, though. I don't think we got enough money. I said, well, let's go with it the way we got it now. And if we have to reduce it down, well, no, we better do it. So we shrunk the building, not a whole lot, but by a little bit. And uh, Norm, strong-armed, coddled. Everybody, every builder in town, <laughs> and and got that building built for half of what the budget was supposed to be. Oh, well, I nice. did a great job, and we could have built the bigger building at the time. <laughs> so. But uh, yeah, he was. He he, he enjoyed building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He he really enjoyed. Uh, um, where did you where did you go to high school? I went to Harpersville until I was in a grade. I got out of the tenth grade. Okay. And if I had graduated there, there would have been about 50 kids in the graduating class. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So, have grown up through the whole school, I knew everybody. Yeah, knew sure, all the right. teachers. Oh, yeah. And when we came to Henrietta, <laughs> 460 kids in the graduating <laughs> class. <laughs> and, and here I am, this little kid coming into this, and I, I was lost. I made a few friends, but not like the friends I had. They're yeah, growing, right. growing up, and, and, and it, it didn't really trigger a lot then, but when I went back for my grandmother's funeral, and, I, and they had the casket in her church, which I became, I was a member of the Methodist church, and the, the cute little stone church is still standing, and they had her casket in there, and I go up, I'm up there, hey George, I only came here because uh, because you, your grandmother, I knew you would be in town. I, I was just, my wife was looking at me, who are all these guys? I said, these are the guys I grew up with. Your friends, yeah. And that, and it, as 
you get a little older, that kind of stuff kicks yeah. in. Yeah. And I went back down there last year for a chicken barbecue and met one of my uncle's classmates from the 50s. And we sat in that church for two hours and just chatted about Harpersville. <laughs> and it's just, it was just a wonderful life. And I, I come up here, obviously I made a couple friends because the guy I went to school with is the one that set up my blind date because <laughs> my, my wife and his girlfriend were going for hairdressing out at the Foreman Center at the time. Oh, okay. And I got, I got to meet her parents and I, they treated me just like another son. Yeah. They, 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 they did. It, I couldn't have asked. You, you know, you knew them. Oh, I, they, I knew, they, I knew your your father-in-law. I didn't know your mother-in-law too well, but I did know her. Him. Yeah. Well, she, she had, she was a nice Italian lady who was brought up on High Street, where her parents still lived, and she told me one time. She goes, "Remember that door? It only swings one way. If you're out of it." You ain't never coming back in. <laughs> and, and she was only like 95 pounds soaking wet. But when she pointed that finger, <laughs> she meant it. But they were, I couldn't have asked to be treated any better. Especially because now my parents were down in Florida and I had, I had nobody else here. Yeah. And when my parents decided to move, we had been dating for three years. I said, do you want to go to Florida? And Melissa looked at me and she goes, bye. Yeah. So I turned around to my parents and I said, bye. bye. <laughs> and now did she grow up in Webster or did she grow up in Rundle Creek? No, she, she, she grew up here in Webster. They lived on, um, on the table. They, they lived off Adams Road for a while. They lived on Wall Road for a while. Um, I don't know what year Norm built the house on Tanglewood. He built all the houses. We just had those those eight millimeter movies made into a DVD, so there's no there's just music with it. But here's my father-in-law building his house. They're running around. It got the old Jeep, and they it was it, it was just great up there. I, I was brought into that family, and they made me one of theirs. And it, it, I couldn't ask for anything more. They um, my mother-in-law. Her father was one of 11, and we'd go to family get-togethers, and Norm would always go. He goes, George, remember all those faces, because there's a test at the end of the day that you have to pass. <laughs> and it was, it was some really, really great times. And when I proposed to Melissa on Lake Road, we were having a family get-together, and then we got married in the Methodist church right here. Ah. And at the time, I was working for Charlie Bash. Oh, oh goodness. <laughs> I, I had the opportunity to work for Charlie Bash for three years. We built break walls. We built Art Wilbur's house up on Salt Road. We, we did the mason work where the old Webster drugstore was, where it was now Sherman Williams. And we did all that concrete oh, work by hand yeah. because the concrete guys were on strike. So we're out there shoveling gravel and sand into the cement mixer and making cement and wheeling it all day long. <laughs> and if you ever worked for a mason contractor, you know what real labor is because mm -hmm. you're, you're working. But I, I got to know young Charlie, well, now he's old Charlie Bash, but he, young Charlie <laughs> Bash. I worked with him and Bill, and we did break walls down on the lake. and. Uh, they, they told me, if, if you want to make a good living for yourself, you might want to try something other from Ma than Mesa work because this will wear you out fast. Charlie is my neighbor, and he walks around the block every day, and it looks painful for him to be walking. He really yes. does. Yeah. He, yeah, he you know, he's stiff. And he, he's, well, when we were working, he'd come in, and he'd walk in kind of funny. He had both. He told me when he got up in the morning, he lived over on Covewood. Mm -hmm. he, had, he had bone spurs in his feet. Oh. It was just painful for him to walk. Oh. Yeah. But when, when, I, when I left working there to pursue what, what I had, George, if you ever need a job, come on back. I, I said, I will if I have to, but I, I need to find it. <laughs> because I've seen what it did to, to 
Masons, how they're always walking crippled over, and I, I, didn't, I didn't need to end up my life like that. But the, uh, the week that we were getting married, they decided they had to do the work on the Methodist church, the brickwork. So we set scaffolding up on the main street side of the church to work on this event. I said, now guys, well, George, we got it coming. I go, okay. So we put the scaffolding up and we did everything out of the side of the church. Oh, gee. And, and we had, the, 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 the preacher we had, I, I don't remember his name, but I remember he looked like a leprechaun. He had, he had the little beard. Oh, yeah. And we told our friends, don't be late because it's not going to be a long service. <laughs> I think the service lasted, I think they said seven or eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, Norm gave, got up and gave his wife, his, my, my wife to me, and my parents were there, and my grandmother was there, and, and her grandparents, and we got up there, did our these and thous, and we're walking out, and there's people walking in. <laughs> <laughs> what I miss? I said, <laughs> I we're done. <laughs> it, and then we... Uh, we we went to the Heritage House. Oh yeah. Remember oh, the Her goodness. Heritage yeah. House? Yeah. See, I think we should give it a try. <laughs> oh, have you seen it lately? No. Oh, I, oh it's so sad. My, my my daughter lives off a of gravel road. Oh. Yeah. And I am I am more or less my daughter my grandson's Uber. <laughs> because I'm Dad, can you take him this day? Can you take him that day? Dad, Dad, can you pick him up from here? And she told me, Dad, if you didn't retire. I'd have to quit my job, Dad. <laughs> but but it, we when we had our two, we lived in Arundequoit. We bought our first house in Arundequoit in uh, 1976, and um, we lived there until 1983. And both our kids were born while we lived there. And I said, I got to put an addition on the house. My father-in-law, the home builder, he goes, I can build you a house much better than trying to add addition on this very old house. <laughs> so in 1980, we bought our property right on the corner of Holt Road and Clem Road. And we held on to it for a little while. In 1983, we built our house. And we moved in just after school started because our daughter was going to kindergarten there. So her and I slept on the floor in that house for like about a week or so before we got moved into the house <laughs> so she could start and have every school day uh, yeah. in Webster. With her, with her new thing in Webster. <laughs> so we'd, I'd walk around, she'd meet the bus, and then go on what we had to do. But we, we've lived at, at that house since 83, and uh, I couldn't be happier. I get to know more people. Now people where is the house? Holt Road in North, Clem Road. Northwest corner which, of Holt and Clem. Northwest. Northwest. The thing is, we've given a plaque down there something. No, no. Oh, you, you know where the comfort care is? Yeah. I'm Kitty Corner. I'm Kitty right. Corner across oh, the street. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right across There's the street. There's the old school house oh, on one side. Right, and, and the comfort, comfort care. care. Then that small ranch home, and George is on the other side. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. I just, now, I got a question line. for you. It's a contemporary question. And just because of my own ignorance, what's the blue light mean on the front of your house? Police. Safe haven? Police. Oh. S support for the police. Okay. Because uh, I, um, it pains me to watch the news and how these guys that are trying to protect us and save us are treated. Yeah. You know, they, they go to work every day. They don't know if they're going home. And, and that, so, and I'm, I'm going to leave that on. Yeah, but what, how did, do they, is, is, it, is it something that's done nationwide or is it something? Well, some people do it for autism. Some oh. people do it for the Jack Foundation. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Because I have seen several of them around town. Yeah, and, and a lot, some, some will do yeah. autism. And some people started doing it for the police, and I, and I kept doing that. And I've had a lot of friends that have gone through the police department here in Webster. Yeah. In fact, I've gotten to ride with some of the officers through town. Yeah. And... Webster has a whole lot of secrets that a whole lot of people yeah. either don't know or don't want to know. And, the, and these guys deal with it. I used to run the Webster food cupboard. <laughs> I know some of them. 
<laughs> yeah, and uh, so, so we we built our house, couldn't be happier. And uh, the the one thing that my kids got known for in school, my fortieth birthday, I've been known to be a practical joker, <laughs> so we say. And uh, we went away for a Girl Scout getaway on my fortieth birthday. And when we came down Clem Road to home, I said, why is the sky lit up? <laughs> I got home, and there's Melvin DeWitt's wooden outhouse on my roof. On your roof? It was on the roof of my house with uh, toilet paper and mud running down the side. Oh, dear Lord. And then the, the, the dear friends had gone out and picked up all kinds of curbside furniture and built a living room in my side yard. Oh, that's cute idea. <laughs> and they had made an eight by eight sign wishing me happy birthday <laughs> with two pieces of plywood with happy 40th George on it. They had taken 200 feet of garden hose and wrapped it around all my trees. Oh, my <laughs> and then my company car was backed in the driveway. And my driveway's got a little slope on it. So I pull in and my car, the company car was sitting kind of up in the air. They had taken some bricks and painted them and jacked my company car up. Nobody would admit to it. <laughs> of course not. No, nobody would. And it took How'd them... they get the outhouse up? Give me one second. Okay. <laughs> Jack it up. Uh, I finally got convinced them to come over and help me, but it took like two or three days for them to come over. And even some of the junk furniture that I took to the curb, one of them was a recliner that was broken. Some lady came and sat in it until her husband came back with a truck to take it. <laughs> <laughs> and my gutters are still dented from getting oh, help oh. to slide yeah. the outhouse off. My father-in-law, brother-in-laws, and friends, Steve Short being one of them, oh, would never admit to it. So a month or two later, my neighbor to the north, who she was up gardening and her wheelchair got stuck. And she goes, George, can you help me? So I come over and I help her out. She goes, uh, a few weeks back, how come your brother-in-law was here with a boom truck? Oh. They hired a boom truck to bring the outhouse in and set it on my roof. Oh. I thought you were going to say Steve Short. Uh, when he was <laughs> <laughs> and, and they, some, somebody, I think it was Larry Lochner, came and got the outhouse. So my kids would, they were in school, obviously, and um, they, where, do you, where do you live? Well, I live in Holt and Clem. Whereabouts? Do you remember the house with the outhouse on it? Yeah, that's where I live. <laughs> <laughs> but but th that's, that's the things that our family would do. I mean, my father-in-law built a house for his brother on Berg Road. And the bride didn't like chickens. Uh -oh. <laughs> so she'd have to ask us to help her decorate the house. <laughs> We'd go to Bonton and find the ugliest chickens possible and hang them on her tree. <laughs> Kiwanis, you, you ever remember Kiwanis having farmer's night where they would sell things? Yeah. Well, my father-in-law went there and he bought two roosters and two hens from somebody's failed 4-H project. And yeah, they ended up in Uncle's Garage at 10 o'clock at night. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and I Sounds got a call like the next morning, and I, I was sworn to secrecy by my father-in-law, who looked j just like Mr. Clean. If you had needed a model for Mr. Clean, that would have been him. <laughs> and he swore us to secrecy. Except for the earring. <laughs> yeah. So I, I get beat up by the aunt on the phone. My wife calls me, and... We're very open with each other. Do you know anything about any chickens at Uncle Bobby's house? No. Are you really sure you don't know anything <laughs> about chickens? Yeah. Well, I need to tell you, my dad gave you up. Aww. I said, the guy that swore me the secrecy <laughs> gave me up. <laughs> but that, that's some of the things that we would do. We, we, enjo enjoyed, we enjoyed life. I mean... I could go on just the rest of the time talking about some of the things that my brother-in-law 
my father-in-law did to each other and what we did and but it was the, the memories are unreal living with that with the Curry family they treated me fantastic in fact my uncle that lived up lived on Lake Road he's the one that put a good word in at our G and E for me to get in there and I always promised never to have anybody come back to him and say what did you what did you sell us here <laughs> so I read meters for a year there I got into gas the, the, the guys that go out on gas leaks, where gas mains are blowing, houses are blowing up, and things like that. And I did that for eight years until I ruptured a disc in my back. And the doctor said, well, you can go back to work, but the next time you hurt yourself, I'll have a knife and you'll be face down. And I had seen enough people go through back surgeries. Yeah. And I had an opportunity to become an inspector for our genie working on gas. Did you know Danny Van Dor? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Yep. You, you can reel off when it comes to field people, RG&E. I, I got in the field there in 76, and I retired December of 2015. And I can tell you during that time that I got to go into some of the greatest places in Rochester. And sometimes I'd have to pinch myself and say, I'm getting paid to work here and be here. I mean, there's houses off of East Avenue that would have theaters they, they built for their kids in the 30s and 40s. And one day we got called for emergency leak on East Boulevard. Oh. Oh. Yeah. 16 the, East the Boulevard? The oldest house oh. on East Boulevard. It has a scrub floor. Yes. <laughs> the, the, the lady rushed home. She was out volunteering someplace, and she was in her 90s. <laughs> but, but we got to go in, a, you know, you walk in the plank floors, every alcove for everything, the bubbles in the glass. I'm going, yeah, I'm, I'm still working. And like the staircase going down, it came up with curls on it. And you go down, and there, there was a table at the gas meters that we had to move. There was a book on the antiques from 1940, the book was from. <laughs> I'm going, but that's some of the highlights I got to see and yeah. go into yeah. all over. And I also got to see things that I will not describe here because where, where do you, the drug deals are going on. Oh, I know. And yeah. Yeah. you got people that live a different lifestyle that is hard to describe to anybody. I mean, Clifford Avenue, I worked there one whole summer from oh, Goodman wow. Street to St. Paul, and I I learned an awful lot that year, and stuff that, <laughs> like uh, like the police and the firemen, there's stuff you can't unsee. You, you just, you, you can't unsee, and you can't comprehend how people our live. Our church, it. our Lithuanian church, was right on Hudson Avenue, right close to Clifford. And, uh, yeah, there was a lot. We did bingo at seen. night. Yeah. One night there was a squat team or whatever they called them. Yeah. They came in in a black truck and they well, told yeah. them put us on lockdown, open the doors and all the SWAT team comes out and all black, you know, whatever. Yeah, it and was. And their guns. It. It of of all these things that I've seen in my life, and I only realized this after I retired. The job, it was a job. With the people I got to meet, the people I got to deal with, that was that, that was the best part. From one extreme to the other, probably. Oh, oh, oh yeah, I, I get to deal with the worst. I mean, I had to deal with the people from the Memorial Art Gallery, which, because they, they, they would, no, we had, we had to kill a gas main, a, a, a big transmission line right in front of them, and we had to find a date to do it so the temperature was right, so the temp nothing got damaged inside. We had to oh, maintain some yeah. pressure for them to keep oh heat goodness. going. And it's, I worked with the police department. We closed some roads. And did, it, you have, did we ever have anything blow up from a gas leak yes. in Rochester? We did? Yeah. Yes. Brighton. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Antlers Drive and uh, Bonnie Bray and that stuff. What was, that was what, middle 50s? That was September 1951. I was like uh, three months old. <laughs> and 
we were doing a big gas job in Brighton on the 50th anniversary. Oh, wow. So I got to go with the contractors to the houses and a couple ladies. You see that garage behind my house? Yeah. That used to match the house that was here before you blew it up. Ma'am, I was only three months old. <laughs> it wasn't me before you blew it up. But yeah. It, oh, it, that was... You, you, I remember that. Yeah, was, yeah. All over the papers, obviously. I remember that. Too. It was... Uh, I don't know how many... How many houses? It wasn't a lot of them, but... It was, they, it was sporadic. Yeah. And the only kids, the only people that got killed was when the parents sent them into the basement. The gas meters were in the basement. That's where the kids got killed. The fire department that's on the corner of Elmwood and Winton Road, they would only, they, they stopped responding to calls. They, they would just hear something blow up and they would go. That, that it was that bad. Yeah, it was. It, scary. It, it was. Oh, I mean, it just wiped the houses right off the Did they get, all get out of their houses then immediately or what? Well, you, only, you only lost a couple. Yeah. And because I ran, I was there, I ran into a guy that was an insurance adjuster that worked this worked at and I have in my possession his whole report of what happened, how it happened, oh. and what caused it. There's that Scotty's gas station on the corner oh, yeah. of uh, Monroe and Winton. And, and yeah. Well they had worked on something there to regulate the pressure, but they couldn't finish it. And does anybody remember what they used to use to protect excavations at night when the before flashers? Yeah. Little kerosene pots. Yeah. yeah. The little kerosene pots. Like lantern type stuff. Yeah. So they put the little carrot they covered the hole and put the kerosene pots out. So the insurance adjuster said somebody had been doing some blasting or something and it rattled something and something started leaking in the hole and it over pressurized the gas system. So it was pushing too much pressure into the house and the only, the way to tell now if you have too much pressure in your house, if you got a pilot light on your stove, your pilot might might be like this. If you get too much pressure, your pilot light might be like that. Oh, wow. <laughs> but I, in my time at rg and &E, I got a little exposure to Jersey Street when, when the guy blew his house up. I, I was sent to another one, but we were called off where we got there. McNaughton Street, we got called to an explosion. Now, these are big, massive houses from the early 1900s. We got there, the mom's car is parked over the sidewalk, not up to the house. And there was nothing left. There was absolutely nothing left of the house. Now this is like a two and a half, three story house. Mm -hmm. And everybody looks at the house. Now these houses are what, a driveway width apart. Yeah. And I had to walk the area with the Public Service Commission checking for more leaks and seeing doors blowing off frames like three houses away. Oh my goodness. But we're standing looking at the house and everybody goes, look at the house next door. It blew the siding off. It didn't blow the siding. It took the whole wall from that house and then planted it in the wall of the house next door. Oh, oh my goodness. goodness. You, you see, you've seen all the studs, you've seen the inner workings of the wall implanted. So, yeah, it is. Was, was, it, was, it, was it scary? Yeah. So, it, for us guys that had been around and seen it, it we. We respected the gas. We didn't fear it, but we respected it, oh, and I, yeah. I wouldn't have it any other way. But I, my career at RGE, I couldn't ask for anything else. I got to go out of town on storms. I got to go places, oh, see things, true. and <laughs> go, go go all over. And um, when we lost my in-laws, I'm looking at time. I want to make sure I, I don't. Go too far. Oh, well, you're all right. Go. Cool. So, we lost my in-laws in '92 and '93, eight months apart. My mother-in-law died an horrific death of ovarian cancer. Oh. What was her first name? Pearl. Okay. Pearl Wanda Lazaro. Pearl Wanda. Yeah. Oh, she was a Lazaro. Oh, this, she was a Lazaro. Yeah. Not. Well, you're not, oh, not, not this one. Not, not these. Her, her, her parents were on High Street in the city. Oh. oh, okay. And then eight months later, my father-in-law passed away. And uh, it was cancer too, wasn't it? Yeah. 
it was cancer because of his, what we believe, what he got in the Navy, and he, when he worked for Hebert's uh -oh. as a pipe coverer. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah. well, styrofoam stuff? Asbestos. 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 Yeah. They, they, I was working that day, and I was told it was going to be a three or four hour surgery, and my wife and her brother and sister were there at Rochester General. It's going to be a two or three hour surgery. And I pull up and I see him coming out and I go, this, this is not good. They opened him up, looked at him and closed him back up and said, yeah. we can't do anything. And my, my brother-in-law asked the doctor, he goes, what's going to happen? And the doctor looked at him just like this, he's going to die. Nice. It, it's like, yeah. it, it's, 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 a little no. tough to talk yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. But after after Norman Pearl passed, Frank Click, everybody, everybody know who Frank Click is? Yeah. yeah. He he was on the board down at the cemetery, and he came oh. to Melissa. He goes, uh, Melissa, we need a new secretary. And she goes, well, What do I have to do? Well, we need to computerize the cemetery. Oh, the so. Yeah. May Ross was the secretary, been for many years, and um, that's the great granddaughter of my house, of Roy's yeah. family. Oh, <laughs> that's right. Oh, oh. <laughs> and they, uh, Melissa, said okay. They said, well, we'll set you up in the office down at the cemetery. Now, at the time, it wasn't the big building that's there now. It was just the two garages, <laughs> and um, we'll, we'll set you up in there. Um, that would be an area of like about this big, yeah, <laughs> with no windows. Oh, jeez. And she goes, no. What I we're, don't think so. <laughs> what we're going to do is you can buy me a desk, a chair, and a computer, and you can put them at my house, <laughs> and I'll do it from there. And uh, she did. Now, what year was this about? 1994. 94, okay. And she, uh, she did that. And then we'd have people start calling us, and I need to know where my Uncle Joe is buried, or my oh, uh, or yeah. the relatives. So I would get the shoebox out of the file cabinet, and I'd sit at the coffee table looking <laughs> through. Hey, I found him. <laughs> but in doing that, I started to learn a lot about Webster history. And then you start looking... Look, I've seen that name over here before, and, and you, you, you keep, you, you try to trigger it back and forth. So it, it took her a while, and, and she built a database with the help of one of our friends who was a computer whiz. And, uh, and we've had people try to sell us computer programs for cemeteries. No, we're, we're using what Melissa made. And That's a good program, too. Eight, eight years later, or eight months later, um, Bob Burkholder, another board member, left. And Frank goes, George, you've been doing so much. We'd like to get you on the board. Uh, okay. And I just kept getting more and more involved. And I'm still, I'm still working full-time at RG&E. And everybody goes, what do you know about cemeteries? <laughs> you know, what do you want to know? And so we're having the kids in the house, in the job, in the cemetery, it was just, it was just more and more stuff. You, you, we have visitors coming, yeah. and That's right. <laughs> when when Bill Becker, the the vice the vice president, left, Frank goes, George, it's you. you you're going to be the, you, you're going to be the vice president. So, hello, hello. So. In, while I was vice president, in 2001, we got vandalized. We had three the kids. The cemetery? The cemetery. Oh, wow. Three kids came down and knocked over headstones in section one. Oh. And they, they broke a bunch of the Greek Orthodox, Orthodox stones which had the big crosses on them. And Bob Barton was the officer that caught him because they attempted to vandalize a car the next street over. Huh? Oh, 
Bob. But, but according to Bob, they failed to notice that the hood was still hot. The guy was still awake. They caught him, and they had him up at the police station, and then somebody came in like at 7 o'clock and said, there's something going on at the cemetery. It's really bad. So Bob went down, and it's 7.30 in the morning. I'm getting a knock at the door. On a weekend morning, it's 7 o'clock. You want to answer the door? <laughs> I checked in the bedrooms. Both my kids were there. I don't need to answer the door. And I get a call. George, it's the, this is a, the police are at your door. You need to go talk to them. <laughs> so we went down and looked at it. I stayed there the whole day just talking to people because as soon as it hit the news, because the news media was there. Oh, yeah. And uh, we worked with the district attorney. And after some difficult transactions, it, we got our money back. And the one kid called me, Mr. Baker, um, God, I went to jail. God has forgiven me. I, I think my term was, I'm not God. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I know. He goes, well, if you don't believe me, you can ask your neighbor, my Uncle Ron. He'll tell you. I go, oh, now, now i got to talk to the neighbor about what his nephew did. And they go, I know being drunk and stupid is no excuse. And my answer was, you're right. And then one kid couldn't pay. He goes, I only work at Burger King. I don't make that much money. <laughs> and the district attorney goes, what do you want to do? I said, well, they got one of two options. You can either go to jail or you can pay us. I, 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 I'm not... I'm not feeling real sympathetic right now. So we got our money, but we had already restored the stones because yeah. didn't want the stones getting stained, people coming in and everything. It, just, it was just another lesson in trying to take care of and preserve Webster Union Cemetery. Right. Which, by the way... Did they have a caretaker before you? Well, th there's been... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? There was a caretaker. Um, I'm the president. I don't. You're not a. You're not the caretaker now. You're just I, the president. I, well, you're just the just president. Yeah, just, just the president. Just, just the president. <laughs> this is where you can find the most every day of the week. <laughs> the, yeah, lately it's been like 20 to 30 hours a week. I've been doing cemetery stuff. Oh, so there's a lot of duties that go along with president. Um, yeah, good, good. We got a, we got a secretary. My wife. We got yeah. a treasurer. We don't have a vice president right now, and then there's me. So, I I just last year I came out of my term as president for our state association of cemeteries, and I've been on that. Oh my goodness! I, I did that for 2009 to 2011. I was on the, a director, and then I started my terms to office, which you have to yeah. do. And I was president of the State Association from 2016 through 2018. Uh -huh. So then I get to know and meet a lot more people and find out more about cemeteries. I probably deal with more, some of the best cemetery people in the country. I mean, cemeteries, I was just at a meeting last week and one of our members from Long Island on the board, they did 4,000 burials oh, last year. Last year? Last year. That, that works out, on a six-day basis, that works out to like 17 burials Oh, a my day. goodness. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Much bigger. We, we, do, <laughs> we, we do like 60 or 70 done at Webster Union. And we have... A year. A, a year, yes. Yeah, yeah. Six, <laughs> a day. Because I, I mentioned that one time to somebody. He goes, yeah, that, that's, about a, that's about a day for us. I said, no, that's a year for us. And I've got to visit some of the cemeteries in New York City, and I work with the legislators. And my stuff at the cemetery is I work with our lawyer, mm -hmm. who is an outstanding guy named Dave Coratori. Uh, yeah. We know Dave. Yeah. I, I, I work with the Smith Agency over here for the insurance. Yeah, we know them too. I work with Birchcrest, no, no. making sure our trees are good because. If you look at the cemetery, what's one thing you notice about the cemetery? Yeah, I know. The green. Trees. Mm -hmm. Trees, we got to take care of it. it Could I say, you, uh, they got an award from the Landmark Society. I one saw year that. Um, in, in, yes. two, in 2008, the same year my first grandson was born. Yep. And I, would, I was lucky to go down and ex accept that award for the work that Tom Anderson mainly did. Mr. Anderson 
who was a huge, huge part of Webster Union Cemetery. He started when he was 12 years he old. He was the caretaker. Oh, okay. And he, when he was 12 years old, he got his first paycheck from the cemetery. Because <laughs> his father was superintendent prior to that. Okay. And one of the first lessons he taught me was over in Section 1 where we did all the reenactment. Yeah. He goes, George, when you're driving a lawnmower over there, the ground gives away, that means the box broke. you got to fill it in a little bit. Because nothing over there is in a vault. Everything yeah. was wooden caskets. Oh. So we talked about that. Yeah, I know. I remember. I, I, we I walked I, along, and there were little dips in the ground yeah, by so, a lot of places. So, Mr. Anderson. So, do you do anything? No, you just leave it. Would you fill it in with dirt? Well, we do sometimes, but it also gives character. I, I think it gives character. And uh, up in section two, which is just on the other side of the driveway. We level some of that off, yeah. but we're really hesitant about taking any kind of big equipment over into Section 1. The, uh, the Boy, well, that's true. Yeah. The, the Boy Scouts came in a couple years ago and worked on a scout project in the back of Section 1, which I think was a lot of pauper's graves from the town. There was a, they found a big tablet headstone that was buried like this, and they found and, and they, Mr. Baker, and they, they moved it around. There's a great big rock under it. Let's break that rock. I go, guys, and they go, well, Mr. Rothfuss, who is the current superintendent, Mr. Rothfuss will bring a machine over and move it. I said, I can assure you, none of us will bring that excavator here. Well, why? I said, we don't know how deep they're buried, and I'm pretty sure that great big rock was put there to protect the caskets. Well, we're, I said, we're not cutting stone, we're not cutting the headstone. <laughs> We will build a foundation and put it on top of that. But none yeah. of us want to go over and dig in Section 1. And, and I found out in the 40s, they didn't always call the secretary to do the burials. They would call the sexton. The superintendent was called the sexton. And they'd go down and do a burial. I think three times in 1949. Well, he got to go right here. Well, they'd go to dig. Why? Uh, occupied. And there would Why? be something there. <laughs> there. There was somebody there. Yeah. So obviously, it's, in some places in the country, you can bury too deep. Not at Webster Union. Yeah. No, I don't think any. Does anybody? Well, down near this area. No, I don't think not, anybody, not that anybody I know of. Yeah. And um, I, during my time there, I've got to read a lot of stuff about the history, and. When people ask me how many people are buried there, I have no idea. All I, I, of them. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that, that's a good part. But, all of them. But I was told right around the turn of the 20th century, one of the buildings burned there and burned the records. Oh. And, and you, you, can't, you, you can't really find out who's buried where. I mean, I can take you and show you in section one because there are eight grave lots. Right. I got eight headstones there. I have no idea when they, how and when they got there except for the dates on the stone because right. we lost those records yeah. in the fire. So we try to preserve everything we got. It's okay, now when you say you read and you found a lot of history, what are you reading? I just go in the file cabinets down there. And what, like? Um, uh, Irva Smith. She was president. She was president. She was secretary. Yeah, and she, she, she had the place down on Lake Road. Right. Right on the lake. Mm -hmm. right. Is she buried there? Yeah. Oh, oh, yes. Yeah, she, she, she and Albert both are. Oh. They, they have one of the nicer headstones in, of, in Section 2. It's got all the insignias for all the fraternal organizations that she belonged to. Oh, yeah. And she had one from our state association engraved on her stone. Oh, good. And we make sure that flowers are kept on her grave in the Stroger grave. The cemetery makes sure that happens all the time. Just because for the, why? Why Stroger? Yeah. That's, that's her relatives. That, that's yeah. that, 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 because... Her, did they leave? No. Oh, yeah, yeah, I yes, thought they, they did. left money, right? Oh, they, they certainly did. Yeah. The Strogers did. Yeah. Irva. Oh, Irva did. Ir Irva. Irva, Irva left money for beautification of the cemetery. Oh, okay. It's one of those papers I gave you today, this, that's what that one's for. Yeah. It, so, for, for Irva giving that money, 
well, what what more respect can we give to right. her no, for everything exactly. that, that, that she did? Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's, th there's just so many things to see with the Fosters and the Woodhalls and the Burnettes and... Pellets. The, oh, <laughs> the pellets. Pellets are in this section and this section and back here and... But it's... Walters. To, to, to be given the responsibility in 2007, when Steve Wright said, I, I, I've had enough, I, I, I got other things I'm doing, and I became... That was part of our family, Steve yeah. Wright one. I, I became president in 2007, mm -hmm. and I was, I had been going to the state meetings, and the state pulled me into the association, and it was an honor because I was almost always the smallest cemetery in the room. <laughs> I mean, these guys are coming in... Like the, the, the treasurer runs Greenwood Cemetery. It's the first rural cemetery in New York State and probably the, the country. And it was set up. It's, it's unreal. He's our treasurer. And there would be bills coming in for the association. He'd just go, I'll take care of that. I, I'll, I'll just take care of that. Don't worry about that. So in my association with the cemetery, I've gotten to meet some of the greatest people around. And I even... The, the senators for the area, I've got to meet them. And, and anything I can do to take care of the cemetery, because if the cemetery is not taken care of, it has to be turned over to the town. And the town, if they get possession of the cemetery, they really only have to mow twice a year. That's Harris Road. Yeah. It, it, it's, they don't uh, have to worry about the stones or anything, right? Well, they just mow it. The we, neighbors actually mow hairs more than we, the town does. Right now, we're mowing about twice a week. Eh. We have a guy that mows four days a week, all, continuously. That's, that's his job. And I, I've taken the responsibility it, it's to take care of the past, the history of the town, to take care of today, and look out for the future. Right. Because I was, I was given a cemetery that was very well managed. I read back in the records, like early 1900s, you know who paid a lot of the bills? The board of directors, because they didn't have enough money coming in. They would pay out of their own pocket to pay some of the bills for the cemetery to keep it going. And we're, we're past that. We're, we're the only cemetery in town that has a cremation wall that, that works. People want to want to be there. And it's just a walk through there. What's a cremation wall? It's the columbarium. It, it, it's, it's, it's a columbarium. It's it's an above ground structure oh. where you can put cremated remains in it yeah. instead of leaving them home on the shelf or putting them in a in a regular grave site. Yeah, you, you, you can you, still put them in a grave. You, site. you can you can put them in the grave. Yeah. It, some people, even my family down in Florida, I lost a niece. And I said, where is she buried? They go, well, she was cremated. Yeah. I said, I know. Where was she buried? But, George, you don't understand. She was cremated. I said, guys, I've been, in, I've been in the business since 95. I understand cremation. I understand burials. I understand walls. They, they, went, they, they separated her ashes up between all her brothers and sisters and just... So, so yeah. we're doing whatever we can to capture... Cremations because people <clears throat> just go put them in the shelf, put them in the garage, and when they're gone, History they're gone. gone. <laughs> and and, and, and here's, a, here's a little tidbit of information. We just joined the chamber, and we're allowed to do, by, by state law starting in 2016, to put cremated domestic pets in the grave in a human oh. cemetery. That's well, wonderful. Oh. That's well, really good. Be, because That's what was, good idea. Because yeah, what was happening... There was a pet cemetery down near New York City. They were accepting human remains cool. to be buried in a pet cemetery. <laughs> They're not regulated, and that, pet, that I believe that cemetery has been abandoned now. Yeah. So somebody's loved one is buried with their pet, and nobody's taking care of it. And the history's done. So, Jeez. 
We snuck my aunt's poodle in with her <laughs> well, <laughs> before the rule. <laughs> and, and anyone that believes that that didn't happen before the law passed oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> is, <yeah. laughs> is fooling themselves. Right. Yeah. But this lady I met that runs a pet crematory for Harris Funeral Homes, I yeah. asked her, I said, how many people pick up their cremated pet remains? She goes, 100%. Isn't that interesting? Oh, yeah. It, and, you know, and you know, it's... we got a couple of them sitting yeah. home. It, it's, so do I. It, it's much, Lanterns much lower for brown, people going back and picking up their loved ones. Yeah. In, in, the, in, in the basement of funeral homes, you'll find some. And out at Whitehaven, funeral homes have gotten together and bought crypts and put the cremated remains in there. Wow. I have a friend in Buffalo that runs a crematory and a mausoleum. He goes, George, I can tell you 130 cremated remains will fit into one crypt. He goes, I've only opened it up four times to take people out. Wow. So, yeah. it, and one of our suppliers said it like this, which I thought was pretty good. He goes, when Grandpa dies, would you throw his casket in the back seat of your car? <laughs> no. Then why are you throwing the cremated remains of your dad in the back of your car? Yeah. Oh, so, my, my kitty's in my car right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the uncle, the uncle that we took the chickens to his house and everything, yeah. she had him cremated. And I, I got to add this in here. You remember the story about the chickens at the house? Yeah. yeah. We had the funeral over at Willard Scott. And she's standing there at his casket. She goes, I know he did something. I know he did something. I go, what, what are you talking about? Baker, I know you put chickens in here someplace. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so this is when we had a, a two-hour break in between to get something to eat. Oh, no. So what do I, where, where do you think I went for Willard Scott Funeral Home? To the chicken farm. <laughs> Kittleburgers. Oh. They had... A, a pair of wrought iron chickens. Oh. I, I <laughs> bought them. <laughs> I took them back up there and inconspicuously placed one at the head of the casket and one on the other side of her. Oh. And, she's, and she's, George, George. I said, Aunt Bonnie. And uh, her, her stepson goes, Bonnie, like this. And she looks down and she goes, ah. And when Bob Barton is starting to do the service, one of them falls over. Now, if you're, if you're in a service in a funeral home and a wrought iron chicken falls over, it was like, damn you, George. And, and, and afterwards, I said, what do you want to do with the chickens? She goes, I want them in the casket with him. Oh, oh my goodness. But he was cremated. <laughs> and when he was cremated, she brought the box home and set it on her nightstand. And as life goes on, she had moved on with life and she met another guy and everything. She goes, I'm not getting any closure. You know, I'm, I'm having a hard time with closure. Uh -huh. I, said, I said, I can't imagine yeah. bringing a new love of your life into your bedroom and having your husband's cremated remains on your nightstand. <laughs> I, I, I said, and she, she called me several times. I want to make arrangements, George. I said, Aunt Bonnie, you, you know how to get a hold of me. I will, I will help you. And oh. to this day. She, oh, she still isn't there. Oh, no. My so the cemetery will do the wall. We've just increased how many cremated remains you can put on a, on a vault just to help make it easier for people mm -hmm. because so many people a generation is being lost and where would we be if we didn't have the history of Webster down in our cemetery yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. so well I think we certainly found that out last yeah, year yeah the <laughs> tour was so important because it shows it, it, another part of history yeah. where you can find more history yeah and, 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 and we love the term I had read in a book uh, a cemetery is a history book with grass it, it, that, that, that's about that it yeah. and, and, and that's and that's what we're trying to do down there so you can just say I'm the president but I'm the one that's going out and looking for materials to buy 
I just had to go hire a new superintendent because the superintendent we have is retiring only because he wants to go take care of his wife who has some health concerns. Is it Tom? Yeah. Yes. Yes, his wife has some health concerns oh, and, and he wants to be with her. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. So he's going to take that and we're lucky enough to find a guy at the highway department and when we found him, Joe Herbst, the superintendent, goes, George, you couldn't have found a better guy to come down there and work with you. Who would you find? A guy named Mike Stringer. Uh -huh. His wife runs the honey store uh -huh. right here in town. Will he be doing rural cemetery? Is Tom retiring from rural as well? It's, it's, as, far, as far as I know, he's staying at rural. Okay. Staying at rural. It's, Too much. It, and I've had people ask me, what about rural? I said, ask me about Webster Union. Yeah. Webster yeah. Rural is its own, and, and, I, and I'll worry about Webster Union. Well, is, is Mike the one that lives on the corner of uh, Whiting and Shoemaker? Is that where he no, lives? He lives in Ontario. Oh, in I think Ontario. Kenyon. Because there's a highway department guy that lives down on that corner, and they sell honey. Yeah, well, this the house. His, his wife works for somebody out in Farmington, oh. and she sells there. And um, A little story you'll appreciate. Uh, back in the days, uh, in our faculty room at DeWitt Road School, teachers had to take turns making a coffee each month. So we made the coffee, and then we used Coffee Mate and Cremora as the two, you know, milk yeah. for the coffee. So it was my husband's turn one day, and he came in, and he looked all over everything, and he said, oh, it looks like I've got to buy some Cremate. <laughs> well, he had put together the Cremora and the Coffee Mate. Oh. And so forever. It was called cremate. <laughs> we still call it that. <laughs> well, I think, you know, one of the things that, that is tied to you, but it's also tied to Webster Union, is the program that you've had for cleaning up the headstones down there. You know, that's been just a, a marvelous yeah. thing. We, 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 I, I got a call from Steve Cataldi, brother-in-law of Patty Cataldi on the town board. Mm -hmm. George. We'd like to, I'd like to get a group together and come down and clean veterans' headstones. Oh, that's nice. So I didn't have time to go to the board. So what two people do you think I went to in this day and age to see if it was okay to do that? One was Dave Coratori. <laughs> the other one was Ian Smith to make sure the cemetery was protected legally and yeah. in, oh, in, yeah. in, in everything. Legally, yeah, and if something so, happened. But, but there's something about the volu volunteerism and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. And, and they both go almost simultaneously, George, don't let this pass you by. Mm -hmm. <laughs> have, have you done it yet? Or, or? Oh, they've well, been doing it. We've we, we, been doing it. We've, yeah. we've done it. This, this is our third year. We do it two times a year. Well, we did the one for this year. We did the fourth, and we're doing this Sunday. Wait a minute. But tell me, do, once you've cleaned them, how long does that last? Um, Indefinitely, or just about because? Oh, good. Because oh, okay. what we do, like Ebenezer's and his wife's and patients foster, mm -hmm. I, I'm doing those. They're they're big tablets, and they're just in the ground. And we got this formula that they use out of Arlington. It's called D two. You spray the stone with a diluted formula of that, and you let it set, and you get your hoses out, and you get your buckets out, and then there's no wire brushes involved. It's all nylon brushes, toothpicks, popsicle sticks to clean the lettering out, and then, and then you scrub the stone, and then you rinse it off, and you have to you scrub the stone again, and you, you, when you're all done, when you think you've got as clean as you can get it, you take this solution and spray it all over it again, and you just walk away. That it, keeps the stuff from growing back. It, it, oh, it, it that's does. cool. I, yeah. I did Don Holliter's mom, Don Holliter Stadium. Mm -hmm. His mom is buried at the cemetery. Yeah. And they came in a few years ago, and the, do you know where this is? I found it. And I said, you know, if you're going to do something, I'm going to clean the stone. So I cleaned the stone. And I just, this was like three or four years ago. Yeah. And it, it still looked, except when it's raining, it gets muddy. The mud will splash up on it. But it still looks great. And Ebenezer's, his stone, his, him and his wife's stone, you can still stand out on Woodhall Road and look in and see his white stone. Oh, that's yeah. great. Wow. It, well, it, just, it just inhibits the growth. It, yeah. when, when we did it on the 4th, 
We did not advertise. The only thing Steve did was put it out on Facebook. We had about 40 people there. Jeez. And I'm thinking we cleaned like about 100 stones. In the park you give a, do you tell them how to do it or is that what yes, you mean? Yes, yeah. yes. You give like a class? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a quickie class on don't bring a wire brush in here. Yeah. And you can use your bare hands. You, you're probably going to get wet. And if it's chilly out... You can use your bare hands on that. That's all I use. Oh. It's, it's, it's a biodegradable... Yeah. It's not material. poisonous or anything. No, it, you, you won't tell. And the, 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 first, the first couple of times that we did it, Steve and myself bought the solution. The solution is 60 bucks a gallon. But we, we spread it out. And it's been going so good and everything... You know, the, the cemetery can afford to buy some of this stuff. Yeah. Well, it, you dilute it quite a ways, too. I mean, you get quite a bit out of it. We, we use like oh, a, then a, you dilute it? We, we, do, we dilute it like a 70% solution, 30% water. Sorry, I didn't mean to be interrupting anything. No, <laughs> no we have no problem. Talk. It's so and, and we, we, we get it sprayed on there, and the, the benefits are great. And I've had people say, Won't pe don't people have a problem with you cleaning the stones? And I said, I've only had one guy, and his name is Tom Pellet, that stopped me from cleaning a headstone. <laughs> what, what, well, yeah, that. but that was a, a, <laughs> that, that, that was for that, that was for last event. September. I wanted Whiting Stone to be just the the, yeah. the, the, the yeah. obelisk there. To, to yeah. So I didn't stop him from doing anything else. <laughs> but if I get a chance, I will get a ladder out there, and I will clean it. it, it well, there's. Uh, you know, I've done the Civil War stuff, and, and yeah. I had to really search to find some of the graves down there when I was backing up because I didn't have any death dates for a lot of the soldiers, so I would get those at the cemetery. And uh, when the veterans, who was a legion in foreign wars, or somebody came down and Char cleaned... Charlie Clark. Charlie Clark, yeah, veterans of foreign wars. There's... Uh, at least a half a dozen of the Civil War guys, their stones look like they were placed yesterday. Mm -hmm. It just reads so much nicer now. You know? George Levins. Yeah. His, his family is, well, right now it's only fenced, a little fenced in, wrought iron thing. That Our superintendent currently took all the pieces from the broken gate and took it down to the foreman center for the kids trying to learn how to weld. Oh, that's and, a good idea. And, um. they, and they put this back together, and then we spray painted it with like a flat gray primer paint to make it fit more in with the area. But because of the nature of the world now, we bought a bicycle chain with lock on it to lock it to one of the posts down there so somebody didn't steal it. Oh. It's, it's, it's a piece of history. Jeez. But the, the cleaning of the stones has been, it's been great. It, Last year, the cemetery had its best year ever, and I, and I think it's a combination of when the people from the, the museum came down, we had 200 people walk through that day. You know what it's like to, for me to see 200 people walking through our cemetery and wanting to learn about Webster? That was... It was a great day. And, oh, and we joined the chamber, more people... And my famous line from somebody, oh, I know your cemetery. And, I, and, my, and my line is, not that one. They, oh, you're the one to end a whole road by target. Not that one. Yeah. <laughs> not nice that the one. one everybody sees. No. Yeah. How many people in Webster do not know about Webster Union Cemetery? Probably a lot. So mm -hmm. going, to the cha going to the chamber, which has been beneficial to the cemetery, having you folks museum come down and do whatever I can and get an article up to the people at the paper because they came down. We had. She a, stayed almost the whole time. Yeah, and we ended up with three or four pages in the Webster Herald along right. with the front page. Yeah. You know what it would cost for advertising <laughs> or something like that? <laughs> they always taught us at the state level get all the free advertising that you can. In, in, in a good example, the Webster Herald. Who has an article in there? What business has an article in there every single week? Randy Henderson. He's given, he's given something to the kids. He's, he's doing something for the, the community. But he's in there every week. 
that there, there's no advertisement better than doing your nail. Yeah. He's gaining. Yeah. Good, it's good for his business. Yeah. I, I, so I, you had uh, you had some inquiries about graves and stuff, didn't you? When we were down there doing the. Yeah. Yeah. There's. I I, I had. I was down there working, and this two the two times it happened. It I, I'm. I'm so convinced things happen for a reason. We had the, the first one, and I'll, I'll get to yours in a second. We had, we're cleaning the building up to dedicate it to Mr. Anderson before he, we wanted to dedicate it before his past because Parkinson's just took him on a terrible landslide. They had a good architect for that building. It, it, where, where the stonework is, it says Mr. Tom Anderson's name. He kept asking Tom Rothfuss. What's a hole in the wall? Why is there a hole in the wall? And we were telling them, you know, we're going to do a drop off for nighttime drop off for cremated <laughs> remains. <laughs> and, and Bob Barton was willing to help us with a podium and everything. And we dedicated the building to him. But what, as we're preparing the building, a guy stopped in, Vermont license plates on his car, and said, I'm looking for my great great grandfather, who happened to be out, Ebenezer Curtis. Revolutionary War vet. Another Ebenezer. <laughs> it, it, so I, I got to see them and, and talk with them. And then the piece Tom is mentioning, I'm out there working in the cemetery, and a guy stopped in, a guy and a lady stopped in. They were driving across the country from Washington State out to Cape Cod. They stopped in the cemetery while I'm there working. I was able to f help her find five generations of her family buried oh in goodness. our cemetery. Wow. And and both times they apologized. <coughs> George, I don't want to take you away from what you're doing. I said, you understand, if you're working in a cemetery and you can help somebody find a, an old family member, right. th there's nothing like that. There's yeah. nothing like that. So th those really stick out that I was able to. But one of the headstones was eaten up by a tree. The, 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 head, the old headstones are there. And so, uh, I don't know how the tree got planted, the seedling dropped. It, it grew up and it was surrounding one stone, and another one got all broken. And she goes, Well, can you move that, put it, put it together and move it? Um, no, because the person that's for us, I can't move. But, you know, people don't think sometimes when they ask those questions. <laughs> but it's working there is an absolute blessing. It's, it's an honor, it's a blessing. So. Well, thank you, George, for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Yeah, it was good time. Good, it, it, good my, stories. All my nervousness was very unfounded. Yeah. <laughs> of course. I told you. Yeah. So. We enjoy history and we love yeah. people who come yeah. to us. Anybody want to come down to the cemetery sometime and take a little tour of history? Just give me a call because yeah. it'll make my wife happy because I'll be out of the house for a little while. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What, one, one side note with the, the, the superintendent, after I retired, he goes, um, did you notice your checkbook's a little light at the end of the year? I go, no. He goes, your wife pays me off to call you out of the house to get out to the cemetery so you're out of the house. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Get problems getting up. It's, uh, I love being down there, and I do appreciate what you did for me with that one little stone there too. Oh, it was, it was our pleasure. We, I finally figured out uh, that that row of graves. There was, there was one open spot in there, and and I finally figured out there is nobody there. That was reserved for my. Well, she would have been my great aunt. Yeah, her husband, and he's actually buried over at West Webster. So that uh, that's why there's that big space between between that small stone and and the rest of the all of that stone. I I had to go I had to go do a favor for somebody yesterday. I, I just want to interrupt. I'm giving you a present. Of the Webster Museum. A little more history. This is a shortened version of Esther Dunn's book, and um, it's, that's why we call it History in a Cup. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> I, I
had a lady call me. Have you been to the cemetery, the Jewish cemetery? Yeah, I know it. We used to go right by it to go over to my in-laws. They, they can't, they can't, by right, they're not supposed to do cremated remains. It's just, my pleasure, absolutely. So, oh. their caretaker is going to do it. Really? Very cremated remains, because they're not supposed to be in it. That's right. That's right. The Jewish faith is supposed to be cremated. Yes.